My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. If you'll be getting your Bibles and turning to Matthew chapter 1, and then just a few moments, we'll go to Romans chapter 3. Yesterday, Tammy and I were out somewhere, and we were driving back, listening to Christian music on the radio, and they were giving some testimonies, and a woman said something in a testimony, and I told Tammy, I said, that's exactly how I feel in many ways. The woman was telling about how that when she was a child, that Christmas time was such a very special time for her, and how she kind of was easy to get caught up in the magic, if I could use that word, of the Christmas season, and and you begin to believe in all of these things that people tell you. But then she shared about how that when she got older and she began to learn differently, she categorized it. She said, I went to a time period in my life where Christmas was kind of in black and white gray color for me. And that's exactly the way I, I think I felt for many years. I was not bah humbug in regards to Christmas, but I could not recapture the magical feeling that I had had as a little child and so therefore I was very disillusioned about Christmas for several years. I wanted that feeling, I was looking for that feeling but I thought that because I couldn't recapture that feeling I thought that really there was really no enjoyment in Christmas. But then uh, God has been gracious enough to me for the past several years to help me to understand that there is wonder in Christmas. There is a uh, I don't hate to use the word magic, but it's a miracle. What God has done for us and what the true, true Christmas message and story is all about. And so last week we looked at uh, the miracle of Christmas. This week we're going to look at the message of Christmas. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all of this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Verse 21, I think, contains within it three very, very important truths just in that one verse. And I really believe that if you can understand these three truths in this one verse, you will understand what is really the true meaning and message of Christmas. So what are the three truths? Well, the truth number one is this. We have sin. The angel told Joseph that she would have a son, call his name Jesus, and that he would save people from their sins. Now, sin is a not a very popular word today, is it? It's not really politically correct to talk about sin. People want to hear about sin. And to tell you the honest truth, I don't want to talk about sin. Some pastors avoid a message on sin, and I don't really like preaching about sin. I would rather preach about happiness and goodness and positive things and I'd rather you walk out of here saying boy that just lifted me up so much I would rather that but but sin is a reality we see it every day in our society and and even though with all of our advancements as humans we are not eradicating sin from society Sin is probably greater today, the evidence of sin, than it's ever been. And not just with terrorist attack, but on television and internet and all of those things. And I have all of that, and I use all of that. But, man, you can't even go through a checkout line in a store without having to be exposed to pornography. 
So it's rampant. Sin is, <clears throat> is rampant. Sin is a reality. Whatever word you want to use there to describe it, there is sin. Look with me at Romans chapter 3. Paul, the Apostle Paul, and probably one of the greatest portions of Scripture <clears throat> in all the Bible helps us, and really the whole book of Romans is about sin, and the first 11 chapters is about how God has delivered us from sin, and the last few chapters, four chapters, is about how we should therefore live. But look at verse 10 of Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> Paul is writing both to Jews and Gentiles, and he says in verse 10, as it is written, meaning it's out of the Old Testament. This is, Paul was not the one who originated this. He's only quoting what is in the Old Testament. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. What does the word righteous mean? The word righteous Biblically speaking, simply means this, to be right. To be righteous means to be right in the right with God. God is righteous. God is right. God is holy. God is perfect. God is pure. So to be righteous is to be right with God. But he says in verse 10, there is none among men, humans, that is righteous, not even one. There is none that truly understands who God is. There is none that's truly seeking after God. There are a lot of religious people in the world. There are people who claim to be spiritual that don't even believe that there's a God. I don't know how we do that. But today, people, even people who don't talk about and believe in God, talk about their spiritual part. But the Bible says it's not a true spirituality. It's not a true, true religion. There's none that really understand it. There's none that is truly seeking after God for who he is and the way that God wants them to seek. Verse 12, they're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. And probably the most troubling part of all this passage is at the end of verse 12, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. Now, I know a lot of good people, don't you? I hear that. I hear people say, that's a good person. Such and such is a good person. Is there such a thing as a good person? Well, comparatively speaking, I would say that there is. Listen, I can rephrase that. There's some people that's a whole lot better than others, right? So if you and I compare ourselves people to people, then maybe we could say, you know, there are some people that are better than others. So we maybe say that there's some people, that's a good, that's a bad person, that's a good person. But when Paul is writing this, he's not talking about us comparing ourselves with a terrorist group or a child molester or something like that. When he says that there is none good, he's using the word good there in reference to the true definition of good, and that is God. That's what Jesus said. A man came to Jesus one day and called him good master. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Are you saying that I'm God is what Jesus was implying by that. So in the true definition of the word good, only God is good. Only God is perfect and holy and righteous. And that's why Paul therefore can say, there's none among men. None of us are good. Verse 23 of Romans 3. For we've all sinned. What does the word sin mean? The word sin actually means to miss the mark. The analogy would be is that if you had a bullseye, Righteousness, if you and I were shooting arrows, spiritual arrows today, and we were trying to, to obtain righteousness, then every arrow that we would shoot would land right in the middle of the bullseye. That's, that's a biblical definition of righteousness, right in the middle of the target. But when we shoot our arrows, they kind of land all over. Sometimes they don't even hit the target, do they? And that's what the word sin means. It means to miss the mark. And so Paul is saying, even the most religious people here upon this earth, and Paul had been a very religious man, he'd been a Pharisee of Pharisees is what he said. And Paul says, when religious men are shooting their spiritual arrows, the arrows are going all over the target. All have sinned, or if you want to compare the goodness of men to the goodness of God, all have come short of the glory of God. There are some good people, comparatively speaking, but if you compare their goodness or my goodness or your goodness to the goodness of God, then we all fall short. So that's truth number one. We all have sin. Truth number two is we need salvation. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now, first of all, what does the word salvation or saved mean? We use that term a lot, at least in a Baptist church, you know. Are you saved? What do we mean by that? Saved from what? 
Well, the word saved or salvation, if you look at the biblical definition, it means to be rescued from danger. It means that an individual, if you, if, if you save someone in a biblical sense, they're in danger in some way and you save them. So therefore you, you are their salvation. You rescue them from that danger. And the word salvation, especially in the Old Testament, sometimes was used not in a spiritual sense, but just in a physical sense. If somebody was in a great physical danger and somebody went in and they rescued them and they brought them out, they saved them from that danger. So what does save or salvation mean in a spiritual sense? It means to be saved from danger. Danger from what? Well, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation at the end of time, let me read to you some verses. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. So one day, men will have to stand before God, meet their maker. Sometimes people want to use the term. Someday, everyone will have to meet their maker. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, the Bible says. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Are you a good record keeper? Let me, let me rephrase that. What, how does your checkbook look? Some people, some people, they think, you know, some, some of you, bless your heart, you have no idea how much money you had in your checkbook. You just hope that you have enough that the next check won't bounce. You, you kind of got a general idea, you know, it's somewhere between zero and 50, but I'm not really for sure. But then some of you, boy, you could tell me down to the penny what's in your checkbook. Michelle here, who keeps the books for us as a church, we require of her to keep records to the penny, to the penny. And every once in a while, because, you know, I have a church credit card and I buy things, every once in a while she'll say, do you have a receipt for such and such? Yeah, I probably do. But see, I can't tell Michelle, listen, I'm the pastor, and you just don't worry about it. No, I've got to give her a receipt for it. Because she's accountable to, to keep records to the penny. What kind of records do you suppose God keeps? Do you suppose God is haphazard in his records? I mean, the God who knows the number of hairs on your head, do you suppose he has any idea what's going on in your life? The Bible says he does. The Bible says he even has a record of the words and that we will give an account even for the words that we use. And this passage teaches us that one day God is going to pull out the records and each of the individuals will stand before him and individually give an account according to their record, according to their works. The Bible again says every man was judged according to their works, which means God is not going to judge somebody more harshly than they deserve to be judged, nor is he going to judge them more leniently. He's just going to be right. Or if you will, he's going to be just. He's going to be righteous in his judgment because that's who God is. He does everything right, everything by the book. He's just in what he does. Then it says this, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Is there a lake of fire? Is there really a hell? Today, the popular thought is, is that there's not really a hell. And if there is a hell, uh, it's not as bad as you might think it is. There are theologians writing books about that today. There's a great controversy within Christianity today. There are some who see anyone who believes, such as myself, that there is a literal hell. I'm a narrow-minded, bigoted kind of person. You're too harsh. We need to make things more, you know, palatable to people. We need to, to make it where people are ready to receive it and, and actually maybe become a Christian. And so one of the ways we've done that is that we need to get hell out of the picture because even the word sounds harsh, doesn't it? I mean, even to say it, I don't know how you feel about it, but even for me to say the word hell in church, I'm thinking, did I say that? You know, because it, seems, it sounds mean and harsh. Yet our penal system that we all want everyone to operate by is based upon biblical concept of punishment for wrongdoing. That's where we're at even, it should be, hopefully, should be as a society. Is there a literal hell? The Bible says that there is. 
Is it eternal? The Bible says that it is. Some people believe that people will be thrown into hell and they'll be annihilated, which means that, yeah, you did wrong and, and Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that you'll be thrown into this hell and that if you're thrown into this hell, that you'll, you'll be burned up and you'll just cease to exist. Is that what's going to happen? Well, Jesus, Jesus told one time, you know, matter of fact, Jesus spoke more about hell than anybody else in the Bible. Why? Because he knows it's reality. He created it for the devil and his angels. One day Jesus was talking about this and he gave the two categories of people. And here's, here's what he said in this. He said, some will go into eternal or everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. <clears throat> Do you believe in eternal life? Do you believe in a heaven that is eternal? Right? Do you believe that? Do you believe that, if, that somebody who goes to heaven is not there just for a couple of weeks and then God says, wait a minute. You know, you're not who I thought you were out here. No. We believe, and I think almost anybody who believes to heaven believes that once you go to heaven, you're in heaven, that it's, that it's eternal. But the same word that Jesus used speaking of an eternal heaven is the same exact word that Jesus used. Eternal, it's the exact same word that Jesus used to talk about an eternal hell or an eternal punishment. Because we have a soul that has been breathed into us by the breath of God, and therefore we are eternal beings in our soul. So there is. But some people will say, but, but listen, preacher, my God is just too loving to ever send anyone to hell. Is God loving? Yes. The Bible says that God is loving. The Bible says God is kind. The Bible says God is merciful, that he's good. Aren't you glad that he's gracious? The Bible says all of that about God. But the Bible also says that God is holy, that he's just, that he's righteous, that he's perfect. And so here, here is the big question that has to be answered. Okay, you ready? Here's the big question that you have to answer inside of yourself. How can a God who is holy, righteous, pure, accept people into heaven who aren't holy, righteous, and pure? That's the big question. That's what separates all the religions of the world. So how can he do it? Muslims, Islam, Muslims believe that, that we are trying to, to the Muslims believe that, there, that there's a, symbolically, not literally, but there's a giant scale in heaven and that they believe that people are born basically good and so therefore basically everybody's on their way to heaven. But if people start doing evil, then the evil outweighs the good and at the end, Allah, which is their name for God, Allah will judge every man in the end and if the bad outweighs the good, then they don't make it to heaven. That's what Muslims believe. Now there's a couple of problems with that theory. By the way, that's what Mormons believe. That's what Jehovah's Witness believe. That's what most believe. There's, there's a couple of problems with that theory. I'll tell you what those problems are. Number one, who feels like you can be perfect, good as God is good? I need to talk with you. You know? No, I, I've never met anybody that said they were perfect. I've met a lot of people say, well, nobody's perfect. You're right, nobody's perfect. So number one, that system really doesn't work because nobody can live by that standard. Secondly is this, once you have committed a sin, what's God supposed to do with it? See, some people think this. Some people, now they don't think this literally, but here's what their, their, their religion is, their philosophy is. Some people believe, how many of you have got a junk closet at home? Come on, tell the truth, you know. Some of you are guilty of the sin of lying, but others, the rest of us, okay? <laughs> Junk closet at home. You've got something that you really wouldn't want everybody to go in, just open up and look, okay? You just put everything in there. I've got junk drawers in my desk, you know? I don't know what's in them. Some people, I think that they kind of, here's what they think. They think that God is kind of like a grandfatherly image and they think that, you know, the good outweighs the bad. And so the good is good and God's happy about the good. What's God going to do with the bad? Well, God's just going to stuff the bad in the bad closet. 
You know, he's got to do something with it. And so he's just going to put it in a bad closet, you know, and he's just trying to shove one more thing into the bad closet and get the door closed. Whew, out of sight, out of mind. There's a problem with that, though, because the Bible says there's an accuser of the brethren. Revelation chapter 12. Who is that? Satan. What does Satan want to do? Here's what Satan wants to do. How can you, as a just, pure God, allow Terry Covey into heaven when I know what's in the closet? And see, what Satan wants to do, uh, the Bible talks about this in 1 John chapter 2 talks about this. What Satan wants to do is that he wants to go and he wants to open up the closet so that it all comes tumbling out. Ha ha! Yeah! You're a holy God! You're a just God! So what's, what does God do with that? Well, if you have a philosophy that your good outweighs your bad and that's what's going to get you to heaven, you have to answer the question, what is a holy God going to do with your bad? That's one philosophy. The other philosophy is this, that not only do we have sin and do we need salvation, but God's provided a Savior. Thou shalt call his name, what? Jesus. What does the name Jesus mean? Jesus is the New Testament version of the Old Testament word named Joshua, Yeshua. It's two words put together. What are those two words? The first word is Jehovah. Who is Jehovah? Jehovah is God. I am that I am. Exodus chapter 3. Jehovah is the first part of the name. The second part of the name actually means salvation. The name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. Here's an interesting thing. The, the Muslims believe that there's a person by the name, there was a person by the name of Jesus who was a great prophet, who was born of a virgin, they, they give him the name Jesus. Here's what they don't realize is that every time they mention the name Jesus, they're actually acknowledging, number one, there's a God by the name of Jehovah. And this God is the God who provides salvation because that's what the name Jesus means. You know, we name children, a lot of times we, know, we name children uh, just because we like the sound of the name. It's cool. You know, that's the name we give to our child, a cool name. Mom said that she named me Terry before I was ever born. There was a time when Terry was cool, you know. But she said that she just didn't know if it was going to be with a Y or with an I. Yeah. But today, and we name children according to what the sound of the name. But in the Bible, people gave names. The name always had a meaning. They gave a name to a child based upon a meaning. And they gave, the angel told Joseph, you're not going to name him Joseph Jr., you will name this child Jesus. Jehovah is salvation. You see, man's theory is that God has to just, you know, the good outweighs the bad, and God just has to sweep the bad under the rug. I don't know what God does with it, but God does somehow, he just forgets the bad. The only problem with that is the devil doesn't forget the bad. That is what man's theory is. Here's God's plan of salvation. I will send my son to this earth and he will, through a human birth, receive a human body. He will be God on the inside, man on the outside. And as this perfect man, when he is fully grown, no man will take his life, but he will willingly lay down his life. He will die on the cross to receive the punishment that the world deserves. Therefore, by that, by faith in him doing that, God says, I will be justified. I will be legally correct and to say, Terry's forgiven. Go look in the closet, Satan. There's nothing there. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. All to him I own. Let me ask you this question today. I know a lot of you are going to receive Christmas gifts this year. A lot of great gifts. You'll give great gifts. Here's what Jesus said. For God so loved the world. Do you want to hear about the love of God? For God so loved the world 
that God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but can have everlasting life. The greatest gift that anyone has ever given, the greatest gift that anyone will ever receive is the complete total forgiveness forever of all of their sins. Past, present, and future. You know, somebody who, who goes through life, I pity people who go through life thinking that their good's got to outweigh their bad because they don't never know whether they're saved or not. They're always going, always going through life wondering, have I done? I mean, how, how much do you need to do in order to be called righteous by God? They never know whether or not they've done enough in order to be saved. But for those who've received Jesus Christ as their Savior, they know that it's all been done. Jesus said the last thing, you know, on the cross, it is finished. Everything that needs to be done is done. Now, I'm just waiting on people to receive it.